Is God good to you? You know, and, and even right now you're going through a difficult time, it's an opportunity for God to show up and reveal himself in the way you need him. That means if you're sick, God can show up as a healer for you. If you have a major need, God can show up as a provider for you. If you have a broken heart, God can show up as the one that comforts and heals your broken heart. If you need a breakthrough, one of the names of the Lord is the Lord of the breakthrough. If you're facing something that's impossible, I have good news for you. All things are possible with God. Or maybe you're facing an addiction today and say, man, I've just said I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to do it. I keep doing it. And I'm thinking if I just keep saying it, it's going to happen. But tonight could be your night of freedom. Because who the sun says free is free indeed. If you're stuck and you don't know what to do, God is a God of wisdom for you. Today, God will show up in every way that you need him. But it's important for you to come here expecting for God to show up. Because God is preparing you for a purpose. There's no one here that doesn't have a purpose. And every obstacle that you're facing is stopping. Is the purpose of an obstacle, the purpose of a challenge, especially if it's spiritual warfare, is to stop you from making progress. And many times you're going through a trial or tribulation or difficulty, and how you respond is going to determine your outcome. Be careful that you don't use a difficult time as an excuse. Because once you use it as an excuse not to move forward and not to accomplish and not to do what God has called you to do or maybe to go backwards, this is what happens. Your life will be full of excuses. Your life will be just a fat excuse. You need, we need to learn how to train ourselves. Now, I will even say this, train the devil. Like you don't mess with me because when you mess with me, I'm going to press forward like I've never pressed forward before. You are waking up a giant. Don't you mess with me because if you thought I was praising God before, evangelizing before, making disciples before, you got another thing coming because I'm going to take it to another level. Come on. Let's take it to another level. Let's not take it to another level of excuses. Let's take it to another level of praise, another level of testimonies, another level of shining our life. Let's give God just one more great praise he's worthy thank you Lord thank you Lord hallelujah awesome I'm gonna pray and then we'll get into the word and we're here to hear the words of Jesus and I love where we are we're in the book of Matthew and chapter 5 and in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7 it's called the Sermon on the Mount it's a famous teaching that Jesus taught his disciples. So it really wasn't a public oratory address. It was a little secret meeting and I'm sure he told the disciples write this down. This is going to prepare you for your purpose in life. So what we do, what we're able to do since it's written down, we're able to be in that little circle and hear what Jesus was sharing with those disciples. And he's still sharing it with us tonight. And just like they took notes so, so carefully that we have the exact words today, I pray that you'll take notes like that today so you could hear it, apply it, and see the results of it. How many know hearing something and not doing something Hearing something and not doing it is foolish. And we got too many know-it-alls that don't do nothing. God's not creating know-it-alls. He's creating know-it-alls that do it all. We know it all, but we do it all. Come on. We hear it and we do it. No matter how difficult it is, we obey God no matter. This is what we do. I had a young adult come up to me um, prior a couple months ago, say, Pastor, with all your wisdom and all your experience, What's the advice, best advice you could give me? And I just said something real simple. Obey the Bible. 
Because if you obey the Bible, you'll be on fire. If you obey the Bible, you'll be successful. If you obey the Bible, you have great relationships. If you obey the Bible, you have some mental peace. If you obey the Bible, you're gonna be overcomer. If you obey the Bible, you're gonna be a, you're gonna be victorious. Come on, just obey the Bible. And maybe that's gonna be your breakthrough today. You've been hearing a lot, but not doing a lot. And then you're wondering why you're not getting results. Come on. We're not hearers. We're what? We're not hearers only. We're doers too. We do, we're here and we do it. All right, let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Father, for everyone that's here. And no one here is an accident, a mistake. And I know this. Unless we enter into a relationship with you and find our God-given purpose, we'll be empty. We'll be lost, we'll be searching for meaning, and we'll be vulnerable to deception because we don't know. But you've given us your word, and your word is truth. And when you speak, you speak truth that we can stand on. There's absolute truths, and they don't change. Truths are greater than facts. Facts sometimes change, but your truth never changes. Times change. Values in society changes. Laws change. But your truth doesn't change. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Speak to us your word tonight. May it settle in our spirit so we could go out there and make a world impact out there. We're here being trained to make an impact out there. Today we're going to be impacted to make an impact. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So glad to see every one of you. Um, last Sunday I went to Mexico. And um, we, I went to the TJ Church. And Lewis and Daly have done a great job. They went out there and planted a church. They're real estate agents. And they went out there and literally planted a church on their own. This is the first time I visited the location. You're talking about real estate agents that go out there and plant a church. They're not real estate agents. They're church planters that do real estate. That's what they do. And, and it's just been amazing. It was amazing. We had around 400 people there in that service. And what was, they got those people from the streets. This is the first time in Tijuana, Mexico, where Adopt-A-Block or outreach has ever been done. The churches are completely surprised. They, they're now thinking, teach us how to do that. And now they're having meetings with other churches and they're saying, we've never seen any church go out there and do some outreach. And what, we've, what ended up happening, a lot of people from the streets came to that service. Families came, kids came, teenagers came. And it, when it was time to make the call to salvation and, and what I talked about was being born again, I believe three quarters of that church stood up and came forward and gave their lives to Jesus. And now they're getting ready to be baptized. Give God a praise because he's a good God doing some great things. And someone asked me, Pastor, did you speak in English or Spanish? I spoke in Spanish. And this is, I preached in Spanish and, and I said, Pastor, can you communicate in Spanish? I could preach in Spanish. I don't know if I could communicate in Spanish. Because when I preach in Spanish, it's God helps me. Sometimes when I'm communicating, I'll mess it all up. But preaching is a whole other thing because I have the power of the Holy Spirit. And people ask me, well, how often do you speak Spanish? I go, well, I spoke, I preached in Spanish twice in around four or five years. That's around it. But, but what I've been doing also is, is practicing Spanish in my prayer time. So I'm, do, I'm developing a prayer language in Spanish, and now I develop a preaching language. So anyways, God will prepare you. When he gives you assignment, he'll prepare you to do it. And what we're going to be doing pretty soon, we're going to la be launching out pretty soon a Spanish service here at this campus pretty soon. And um, I'll be preaching the first message for someone who wants to, oh, I want to hear Pastor Marco speak Spanish. Okay, well, show up. Well, y'all, I'll... All right. All right. I'm so glad you're here. And, and what we're going to be talking about today is one verse, and we're just going to develop this one verse. And we're going through the book of Matthew. And I love that we're going verse by verse in the book of Matthew because it's causing us to 
attack subjects and tackle subjects that are really important for us as believers to fulfill our assignment. Say it with me, to fulfill our assignment. See, if you're, if you're a believer and you're saved, you, your assignment is to, is to impact this world for Jesus Christ. You are here to make disciples of Jesus Christ. You are here to show people Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that actual pattern hasn't changed. We should still be saying something similar to that, that if you see me, you're seeing Jesus. Because I talk like Jesus, I walk like Jesus, I live like Jesus, I speak Jesus' words. We need to get back to Jesus living. And what I mean by that is we got too many believers that gave their lives to Jesus but don't look nothing like him. And if you don't look like Jesus, you cannot lead people to Jesus. If the words of Jesus aren't in your mouth, you cannot cause people to be convicted about the words of Jesus that lead them to salvation and faith. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It is a question, who's speaking the word of God now? And right now we are in a war. Say, we are in a war. We are in a war of words. The enemy speaking words into our children. You know, Pastor Robert was, was, was telling me Cajon High School opened up and all the teachers were trained in New Age. All the teachers were, cha- were trained in worldly tolerance, which gives no room for Christian tolerance. So as soon as they went in, today they started meditation, New Age meditation for 15 minutes. So the teachers are taught to teach the kids, to open them up to the spirit of new age. Every day for 15 minutes, they're going to be meditating new age. And next thing they're going to be throwing up crystals and all the rest of the stuff. Understand there's a spirit that's there. One of the teachers yesterday, or today actually, had the whole class yell, we are animals, we are animals. Everybody loud, we are animals. So the whole class is chanting, we are animals, preparing for a teaching on evolution. We are not animals. We are children of God, created in God's image. But if we don't know the difference, we're going to be swallowing up the words and not being effective. So the question me and Robert were discussing, do we take them out of the schools or do we train them to be effective? And I'm not saying one or the others, it's all where your kid's at. But I do know this, that our kids are in a real battle, you are too. And if we don't train our children and be trained to handle and resist the enemy, this is what's going to happen. The words of the enemy will conquer the words of God in your life. So now Jesus knew that there would be resistance. So he starts teaching them about who they are. A big part of what's happening today, we don't know who we are. In Matthew 5.13 it says this, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? (laughs) Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. There's just two main points in this scripture. One is disciples of Jesus are the salt of the earth. Jesus is teaching his disciples and revealing their purpose to them. Their purpose is to season this world with Jesus, with his words, with his teachings, his values, his lifestyle. The more we are like Christ, the saltier our lives are. 
The title of this sermon is Be Salty. Art, salty, or godly lifestyles can cause people to glorify God. What I've learned in life, unsalty people cannot salt un or season unsalty people. Unholy people cannot season unholy people. Worldly people cannot season worldly people. That means if you're salt, you have different makeup than dirt. We are here to be salty or we're here to be different. Someone say, be salty. In 1 Peter 2, 12, it says this, continue to live such upright lives among the Gentiles or unbelievers. What he's saying, you're in this world with a whole bunch of unbelievers, but don't live like them. Live upright. Live righteous. Live according to the standards of the Word of God. And God's standards are the right standards. They're the good standards. They're the powerful standards. And they're the standards that bring peace and victory in our lives. I want to make an impact. But I can't make an impact if I'm not allowing God to impact me. And the only way I know God's impacting me is my lifestyle is showing his impact. The Bible says in the last days, which we're in, there'll be a group of people that will have a form of godliness, but, den but they'll deny the power that can make them godly. That means they'll talk the Christianity, they'll talk the salty life, but they'll live the unsalty life. They'll say they're Christians or disciples of Jesus Christ, but they don't follow him. They follow Jesus conveniently. If it's convenient, I do it. If it's not inconvenient, change the scripture. A matter of fact, forget about changing the scripture, just change the preacher. Click, click, change the channel. I just go to another church that accepts my lifestyle. I don't know, I don't like Pastor Marco. Like every time I come, he just seems like he's speaking to me. He, I mean, where's the grace? Where's the mercy? You know where the grace is at? The grace delivers you. The grace forgives you. The grace empowers you. Come on. God didn't give you his grace so you can remain the same exact way you were. Come on. Oh, when you were in Christ, all things passed away and everything becomes brand new. What he does, he empowers you to live a life that represents him and his kingdom. Someone say kingdom. If there's a kingdom, there must be a king. And all I'm saying, is Jesus your king or is the devil your king? But you can't have two kings. Let's continue reading 1 Peter 2.12. I'm not rushing through this. I'm just going to let it settle, marinate. Because I'm trying to get you salty. Continue to live such upright lives among the Gentile unbelievers. God is saying you're going to live among Gentiles, unbelievers. We're not here to condemn them. We're not here to judge them. We are here to convert them. We are here to influence them. We're here to impact them with the love of God. We're going to live in a world full of unbelievers. What he's saying is continue to make sure that you're living a lifestyle that could impact them. That among the Gentiles that when they slander you as practicers of evil, they may see your good actions and glorify God when he visits them. And all he's saying here is when you start living a life that's different than the standards of this world, you're going to get some pushback. They might even say you're weird. Oh my gosh, you're weird. No, I'm not. Uh, yes, I am. 
You know what that means? I'm different. I'm peculiar. I'm holy. I'm chosen. I'm set apart. I'm just not the average bear. Come on. Uh, God has created me, and he separated me for a purpose. So call me weird. I'm just telling you that I'm different. But my difference is going to make a difference in your life. I can't be like you if I'm going to help you. We got too many weed-smoking Christians. Ganja Christians, ganja. I come from the islands. They call it ganja. We got too many alcoholic Christians. And I'm not talking about your struggle. I'm talking about you're still practicing it. And using Jesus, drinking wine as an excuse to get drunk every weekend. Praise the Lord. We got too many sexual immoral Christians. That you didn't realize when Jesus Christ died for you, he purchased your soul and your body. You gave Jesus your mind, but you held back your body. Like, not my body, nah. -uh. Sometimes I need sexual healing, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and we're going to go deeper into this because you have to understand the enemy's trying to steal your saltiness. So he's saying when they talk about you, that's okay. Because he goes, just continue living an upright life. Just continue living an upright life. So when God visits them, what that means is when they finally have an encounter with God, they're going to remember you. And you're not going to be an excuse. You're going to be a motivator. I met one of those real believers. I met one of those salty Christians. Those, those kind of people are real. I talk about them, and they still love me. So when God begins to speak to them, this is what he's saying. I'm going to visit them, but I'm going to prepare them for the visit. And your lifestyle prepares them for the visit. Not everybody's going to be reached right when you speak to them. There's many people who are going to be reached after they've been evangelized by your lifestyle. I remember when I was working at the car dealership. I was a young man that came in, just got married. I'm in the car business, and there's this really pretty Filipino girl that works there. She's a mixed Filipino. She's really pretty. And every guy loves it. Just when she walks by, oh, my God. You know, it was two weeks later that the guys are telling me, hey, that girl, she likes you. I'm married. I'm a Christian. And I'm salty. I'm there to season them. They ain't seasoning me. But I know this is what they were doing. God was preparing them for a visit. See, he was going to visit them, not at that moment. He was preparing them if, to see, if, expose them to a real salty believer. Their salvation was on the brink of this decision. So I'm, I... I my, what's my response? It's very simple. I'm, I, I, my, what's my, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I tell them. I'm a believer. I'm totally not interested. I got a wife and I love her. So don't bring that stuff to me ever again. I don't play. Well, pastor, do you offend them? I don't care if I offended them. I'm getting, they might talk about me like they said, but I'm preparing them for a visit. And I don't know when that visit's going to happen, but I know I'm setting them up for impact. Don't negotiate. Be salty. Me flirting with that girl, talking with that girl, they wanted to see if later on, on break, do I talk to her? I don't talk to her on break. She's in that room, I walk out. 
you're not even going to get a picture with me and her. Because I already see some of us right now, you want to be salty, but you're too compromising. You're not doing it all the way, but you're really close. Instead of living a life of how salty you could be, you're living a life on how close you could be to the world without going over the edge. Pues, it's no wonder that your family's not impacted, that no one knows you're a Christian, and there's no pushback. Oh, it's getting quiet up in this church right here. They may see your good actions and glorify God when he visits them. This is crazy. 20 years later, last week, I go to a dealership here in Fontana. My car broke down. I go in, it breaks down, the water pumps out. And I'm picking up my car and I go, well, let me go and see if I could talk to the owner. Because I know him from 20 years ago. We were in a car business together. He's now the owner of the dealership. So I tell one of the salespeople, I want to talk to the owner. He goes, who are you? I go, I know him. We're friends from way back. So I enter into his room. He has a meeting with his head leaders. I walk into that meeting. He goes, Marco! And then he says, guys, this guy is the closest thing I've seen to God. So, there's a visit happening right now. So I begin to talk to his head guy and him. And I tell him what God is doing, how the impact we're making as a church. I start sharing the testimonies, how people come here mentally ill and they get set free, drug addicted and they get set free, marriages are falling apart and they get restored. People that were failures turn into victories. I start telling the story and then I say this, this is what I tell them. And this message I'm ready to share with you is how they're changed. And you know what I do? I start talking about the gospel. I start sharing Jesus. You see, I'm not here to give you positive words. There's a name that you can call on to be set free, to be made whole. Come on. There's a name that you can call on that can change your life, change your heart, and change your desires, give you peace, set you free from the depression, the anxiety, the addiction. His name is Jesus. I'm telling him about Jesus. After I'm done, it's quiet in the room. It's a visitation. 20 years, they talked about me ago. 20 years later, it's time to visit. They didn't know what to say but this. His general sales manager, manager said this. He goes, can you please talk to our whole sales force? And then the owner said, do we need to rent like a hotel or something like that, a conference center to do this? And I go, okay. And he goes, he goes and plus what I want to do is give to your church on a monthly basis. I got to figure that out too. He goes, um, he, he said, uh, uh, and I go, what do you want me to talk about? He goes, the same thing you just told us they need to hear. So right now, me and Robert are going back. We're setting up an appointment, and we're gonna, this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk to them on a monthly basis. Come on. God is setting up church. We're, being salty opens up opportunities, opens up visitations of the Spirit. Don't let the enemy steal your effectiveness, steal your witness, steal your power, steal your impact by getting you to compromise. You see, because when you start living a salty life, you know what it turns into? A bold life. 
See, when you're not living a salty life, this is what happens, you're timid. And the reason you're timid, you're not even sure you're following Jesus. But when you make up your mind, I'm following Jesus, and I'm living a life that's salty, that's committed and devoted to Jesus, when the enemy pops up with his words, you pop up with your words, and you pop up with your boldness, and you pop up with your spirit, and your spirit is greater than the spirit that's in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, we're going to turn the whole series on being salty. I can feel it already. So now, we just covered point number one. Disciples of Jesus are the salt of the earth. And without us, there's no seasoning. Without us, there's no Jesus. Without us, there's no salvation. Without us, there's no hope. Without us, the vision of God does not happen on earth. Salt is valuable. Point number two, we can lose our flavor. We can lose our saltiness. Look what the scripture said. You know what that means? You can start off salty and end up with no flavor. A Christian with no flavor. A Christian with no identity, a Christian with no walk. Hmm. The devil stealing people's saltiness in bedrooms, in porn sites, in conversations. Praise the Lord. We can lose our flavor, and when you lose your flavor, look what the scripture says. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? What good is a Christian on earth if he's nothing like Jesus? Say, what are you talking about, Pastor? If you didn't have a purpose, you would have got saved to go to heaven. He didn't. He got you saved. You gave your life to Jesus so you could show people this lifestyle that they're looking for. Because apart from Christ, they're empty. Apart from Christ, we're lost. Apart from Christ, we're angry. Apart from Christ, we're bound. Apart from Christ, we're confused. Apart from Christ, we have no identity. So someone has to give us an identity. Apart from Christ, we're confused. Apart from Christ, our relationships are falling apart. And this is the truth. We got Christians that their relationships are falling apart because they're apart from Christ. It is possible to lose your impact or lose your flavor. And when we lose our flavor, we cannot fulfill our purpose in reaching the world for Jesus. It is possible to lose our flavor and our impact. In Revelation 2, 5, it says this. So remember the heights from which you have fallen. And... Uh, Christians, stop trying to get your values from TV and YouTube. Because this is what's happening. You're turning into a worldly Christian that loves the world and doesn't know God's word. And this is what, we got Christians nowadays that doubt the word of God. We got believers speaking things like unbelievers. You know, the, the Bible was written by men... You know why you're saying that or anybody says that or any unbeliever says that? Because they don't want to be accountable to the words. So what they're saying is if it's written by men, then I could choose what I want to listen to. And if I don't like it, I just got to say a man wrote that part. 
And either you believe that God's word is 100% pure, 100% right, or you can't believe none of it. The word of God was breathed by God. You know what it means? It comes from his mouth. But he used a whole bunch of heathens and that's the miracle that God can use whoever he wants to get his job done. And many people have gone out there to disprove the word of God. And this is what happens when they go out there to disprove it. Many of them have become believers because they're going to find out that it's a, it's a work of art. It's a work of poetry. It's a perfect word. And they're saying, how could these uneducated people write such a, what, such a perfect work? And, and this is how they did it. They did it through a perfect God. They used imperfect people. And God gave us a perfect standard. And we're not going to get deeper into that, but we could. So now he's saying, remember how you've fallen. When I see fallen, I just, I, I just can't believe it. How many Christians have the values of this world? You talk just like them. Your values are just like, you get offended at what they get offended about. <laughs> Crazy. We got crazy Christians. You know what crazy means? You ain't thinking right. You know what crazy is? You ain't thinking right. You think you're right. Super opinionated, but it's not even an original opinion. You got it from YouTube. I'm trying to act like you're smart. You know what the Bible says? The beginning of wisdom, the beginning of all wisdom is fear of God. And that means you respect God, you honor God, you know there's a creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's hard to believe, Pastor. No, it's not. Who created your shoes? All I'm saying, everything you see has been created. Whether it's a car, a shoe, clothes, all of a sudden the most intricate thing, this ever complicated things that have ever been made, that was an accident though. A building can't build itself. We know that. An art piece can't art itself. You need an artist, you need an architect, you need a builder. But the most intricate thing in the world, a human being and the whole universe, now that was an accident. So you believe, I'm just going to hit that for one more thing. So you actually believe that something comes from nothing? Scientifically, that's impossible. Well, we haven't figured that out yet. And you won't figure it out because there's no such thing scientifically. Okay. I'm, I'm just barely dabbling into that, but, and I'm talking Christians now. We have like a mixed religion, a mixed belief. It says, that, so remember the heights from which you have fallen and repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior. Seek God's will. And do the works you did at the first, when you first knew me. You first knew me. You know what he's saying? I'm talking to Christians that are no longer salty. You used to be on fire. You used to be holy. You used to have a standard. You used to quote the word of God. But somehow you lost it all. You've fallen a long ways. You've morphed into something that's not Christian. When you first knew me. He goes, now, repent. Otherwise, it is possible to lose your impact. I will visit you. And this will not be a good visitation. And remove your lampstand or remove the church or uh, remove your impact from its place unless you repent. Oh my gosh. 
What he's saying, there could be a believer that's totally unrepentant. And God says, I'm going to pull, pull my, pull an impact off your life. Unless you repent, that your life will never, ever have impact again. You'll live a life with no purpose, with no power, with no freedom, with no breakthrough, with no anointing. Demons will not run from you, they'll run with you. Spirits of infirmity will not leave, they'll be attached to you. Peace will go and torment will come. Clarity and wisdom will be gone and there's a reason you're not faithful with what he's taught you. So you've given yourself over to a spirit of deception. And if you allow one area to be allowed deception in, you have a cancer of your mind. It's going to spread. We're going to end it here because it's getting too deep right here. How many like this series already? Salt, salt, salt. Be salty, be salty. All we did was do the intro today. Be salty. Next week, we could get into, this is what we could get into. This is what we get into, God willing, the purpose of salt. And then maybe the week after that, we could cover how do you lose your salt. So we'll get into all that stuff. How many want to learn about being salty? We, we got a t-shirt, be salty. I'm salty. I'm crazy. I'm salty. I, I salty. Any salty Christians up in here? Come on. Let's all stand up. I know we are. I mean, you're here on Wednesday night. You're crazy already. We already know that. We already know you're salty showing up on Wednesday night. But I believe this word is meant to prepare us for purpose. Thank you, Mama. All right, you got me a sweet and salty cashew. I like that. I like that. I'm sweet and salty. You got that. I'm sweet. And, I like that. Chewy granola. Well, there we go. Illustrated sermon right here. I'm going to dismiss in just a second. But before I dismiss, I want to give you an opportunity to live a life of purpose. And I know this, that apart from Christ, you're looking for purpose and you're looking for meaning. And that's why we get into addictions, we get into lifestyles, because you want to be happy. And we're not here to dog nobody because we're all in the same boat. Jesus did not come to save a whole bunch of righteous, self-righteous people. He came to save a whole bunch of sinners like me and you. I said, Pastor, but you were talking about, you said no to that girl. I would have said yes to that girl. I said no to that girl because Jesus came into me and empowered me to say no. If I didn't have Jesus, I would have said yes. But you're married, I know. That's how crazy I would be without Jesus. And I don't want you to say, oh, my Pastor Mark, you live perfect. I don't live a perfect life. But I am sold out to Jesus. I know who my king is. I know who my leader is. I just made up my mind. I'm going to live for God. That's all. Can I become more salty? Definitely. The more I come, become, um, become like Christ and the more I repent of things and thoughts that are unsalty, I, bec I become more impactful. But it all starts with this. And I, giving your life to Jesus, or I'll even say this, God was speaking to Christians today. And he was saying this, unless you repent, I am going to visit you. But the next visit will not be a visit of vision. It will be a visit of removal. I'll take it away. And I've worked with you long enough. This is what the Holy Spirit is telling somebody. I've worked with you long enough and you've shined me on long enough. I brought you here tonight not to remove your impact but to restore your impact. That's what I brought you here tonight for. 
But just because God wants to restore you doesn't mean you need to accept it. And you know why some of you are struggling? You haven't made up your mind 100% yet. Because once you make up your mind 100%, the struggle's gone. Like I'm in. I had to make up my mind when me and Lisa were going out that I was not going to have sex with her. I couldn't like, let's see. Vamos a ver qué pasa. Practicing Spanish for you guys. Because if you want to see, vamos a ver qué pasa, a lot of stuff is going to pasar. So that's still going to happen. I had to make up my mind. And I told Lisa, I remember I ever told her, I want to remain salty for this moment. I had a purpose. I'm moving forward. And I remember that we're, I go, I go honey, we're preparing for great things. I was, I was 20 some years old. I go, we're preparing for great things. And, and right now, I don't want you or me to ruin that. Not that you can't be forgiven, you can't be set free, but still I want you to, I don't want it to start developing a pattern in my life of compromise because it could jump into my future. So I told her, I go, I go, Lisa, you're too tempting for me. So pastor, she's tempting. Yeah, I'm a Christian and she was temptation. And I didn't tell her, get behind me, Satan. But I almost did. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I didn't tell her that. But God gave me a strategy because with every temptation, God makes a way of escape. He makes a way, and you got to look for the way. Someone say, look for the way. There's no temptation you're facing that there's not a way out. So I knew my way out was this. And I didn't talk to nobody because it's always embarrassing when you're dealing with lustful stuff. And I didn't have no one to talk to because everyone around me was lustful too. <laughs> have you ever been there? Like, uh, everybody's like, love. He's like, who am I going to talk to about this? So I talked to the Holy Spirit. And he told me, Marco, you can't kiss her because you're too weak. That was true too. <laughs> he goes, you can't even hug her because you're too weak. So I told Lisa, I had a meeting with her. I had a private meeting. I go, Lisa, no more kissing and no more hugging. I could hold your hand and I could side hug you, but that's it. And once in a while, I might kiss you on the cheek, but even that turns me on. So I'm going to be careful with that. I said, Pastor, why would you do that? I want to remain salty. So, for right around a, a year and a half, we practiced doing ministry, serving God. All that kissing and hugging was, it was it never one time did we compromise on that. And then when we went to the altar, I looked at my wife and I said, I am 100% that you're my, sure you're my wife and we're going to have a wonderful future together because God is in the center of our lives and there's going to be a salty marriage. Come on, anybody want a salty marriage? Sweet and salty. All right, we're going to end it. I got to end it. You guys, are, you guys are making me preach more. You guys, you guys are too hungry for the word. Okay. But if tonight, let's not make this hard. And don't be, don't be hard. Don't make it hard it needs to be. If tonight you're saying, Pastor, I need to be that. He was sending the revelation. He was talking to the church that fell from the standards, and I've fallen from the standard, but I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I want to repent, and I want God to restore my impact, my saltiness. Only he can do that. Can you regain your saltiness? The question was, yes, you can. You can gain your impact. You can gain your, regain your ministry, anointing. All of it happens on a choice. But if you're saying, Pastor, I want to recommit my life to the Lord. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hands. One, two, three. Raise your hands. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I'm, re I'm ready. I've fallen away. i got to recommit. I want you to come up here real quick. Come up here real quick. Let's give them a hand as they're coming up. Come on, you're ready. I'm ready to recommit. I want to get my saltiness back, my impact back. I'm ready to follow Jesus with all my heart. Come forward. Come on, let's give them a hand as they're coming forward. Come on. Somebody needs to surrender it all tonight. Surrender it all tonight. Come on, there it goes. God's going to empower you to do this.
still coming for. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Come on. People are changing. Right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking, and people are saying, yes, change my life, change my life, change my life. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I'm tired of playing. All right. Let's keep coming forward. Someone's going to get healed. Someone's going to get set free. So come on, someone's going to be delivered today. Come on, someone's going to be delivered from the depression. Come on, be delivered from the cycle. Be delivered from the addiction. Right now, in the name of Jesus. It's all going. Now, proud of every one of you. Okay, now, I want to give one more opportunity. This is just 60 seconds to eternity. There's a day that every one of you will die. They said, Pastor, what happens after death? Judgment. You'll stand before God and give an account for everything you've done and lived. Every one of you. And if that day were to happen in the next 24 hours, proud of you, proud of you. In the next 24 hours, do you know where you spend eternity? They said, Pastor, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. Don't leave here not knowing. Well, how do I get into heaven? I'm going to tell you how you don't get into heaven. You don't get into heaven by living a perfect life or living a good life. What I mean by that is you don't get into heaven because you were good enough. Because none of us are good enough. You know what that means? We've all messed up and you will mess up. You cannot have faith in your own works, your own righteousness to be saved. The truth is all of us are sinners and we deserve death, punishment, separation from God. What we've earned, no matter how good a person you are, is separation from God. That's all you've earned. But God loved you so much. I want you to get this. He sent his son. He loves you so much. You are so valuable that he sent his son to die and suffer for the sins that you and I committed. You know what I just did? You and I, why? We're all in the same boat. We all need sinners. You know what they need? Is a savior. They don't need religion. They don't need rules. Sinners need a what? Savior. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, say, Jesus, save me. He'll save you, he'll forgive you, he'll set you free, and he'll give you eternal life. You just got to believe in Jesus. If you say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I'm right with God, but I want to get, I want Jesus to forgive me. I want eternal life, and I want him to come into my life. I'm tired of doing things my way. I want to start doing things God's way. I want to become a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to place my faith in Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to know before I leave this place, I'm saved. I have eternal life. I have a relationship with God. When I count to three, saying that's Pete, me, I'm not sure I'm saved, but I want to get saved. I want to give my life to Jesus. Raise your hand up here, back there. One, two, three. Raise your hands. Come on. Raise your hands. Everybody up here. Anybody out there? Saying that's me. I'm not sure I'm right with God. Come up here. Come on. Come up here. Come up here. Come up here.